So I wanted to gear it towards experiments, so I'm very interested in what Jim and Martin and Paul and uh, I wish George was here, but maybe I'll bend his ear later. So I'm interested in the experimental aspect of this. Um, so who's the unified theory? Okay. Hold on. Just one. I can't see you. Let's see you one more. Okay. Yes. Okay, I just did categories, you know, we had, I had been dinning all of the sessions and I put sent those out in the, in the uh, prep kit. Uh, this one, uh, the interest is the time distance problem. Uh, it is a mature theory, completely replicates gravity and electromagnetism, but no experiment has been proposed, I think, until now. So. So I, I, hope, uh, I hope you find this of interest. Next slide. So uh, why the Calusa theory? Uh, first, I, I just want to motivate it with a little syllogism. I'm not sure it's exactly a syllogism, but there's a bit of logic here. So uh, the time distance problem is a problem of special relativity and general relativity. And you'll see if you look at the time distance problem in your quick study, uh, you'll see it's pretty fundamental. Uh, so it's a hard one to get around. So let's say, uh, so we have uh, the time distance problem, special relativity, general relativity. That's that. Uh, next slide. Now, electromagnetism is the only force of nature that humans control that we do engineering with. Now, I know you say, well, what about nuclear reactors? Uh, that is the strong force or maybe the weak force, but we don't really engineer with it. You know, we can make heat with it and we can boil water with it, but that's about it. Everything else we do is electromagnetic. And in fact, all of the atoms in our bodies are electromagnetic, chemistry is electromagnetic, metallurgy is electromagnetic, power generation, communications, and all the, you know, the surfaces of all the planets. So it's all electromagnetic. So uh, electromagnetism, here's the stuff we control. Uh, next slide. So, you know, the, the thing that got me into this is maybe the solution to the time distance problem is where general relativity intersects with electromagnetism. That would be great because then our toolkit is adequate to the task. So really what I want to do is uh, look for overlap. So really we want to know if a situation is like this and we can work in the region of overlap with the force we control to, uh, to surmount the time distance problem. Next slide. And in fact, the Kaluza theory is just that. There is one. There was a theory that goes back to 1919. That's when Kaluza sent his paper to Einstein. And Einstein sat on it for two years, trying to wrap his head around it, and eventually cut it loose into the ecosystem. So it was published in 1921. Back in those days, you couldn't submit on your own unless you were of a certain stature. So Einstein actually submitted Kaluza's paper in 1921, a unified theory of general relativity and electromagnetism. Uh, next slide. Um, so I, the, uh, the, the key to this, this is totally classical, what I'm talking about. Now, a lot of people say Kaluza, and they instantly think Kaluza Klein, and people say Kaluza Klein. Kaluza did a purely classical thing, and I'm going to show you the details. He did it, it was published in 1921. As we know, the quantum revolution happened in 1925 with Schrodinger and Heisenberg. And so that was the buzz. And so Klein took Kaluza's theory and retooled it for the quantum revolution. And he introduced the idea that the fifth dimension was microscopic and it was closed. 
Uh, and then things were off and running and Kaluza Klein was pretty much a quantum theory ever after. So I want to go all the way back before Klein, just Kaluza, the classical theory uh, that he developed that unified general relativity electromagnetism. Now the basic, uh, go back one slide. Yeah, I'm going to dribble them out or people will get confused reading everything. Uh, so it's based on the power of the Einstein equations. Uh, the Einstein equations uh, th that were published, uh, you know, in 1915, turn out to be the most general, covariant, second-order differential equations. That's it. Uh, and they generalized Laplace's equation. This, this is the, this is also uh, Newton's law of gravity. Just written where instead of the gravitational, I've written the gravitational force as the gradient of a scalar. Standard stuff. But you can see the gravitational constant and uh, the mass. I'm going to use this. Gravitational constant and the mass density of a source. If I integrate this, I can get the standard form where the gravitational force is gmm over r squared. So, power of the Einstein equations. Uh, next slide. Um, the argument for them, I believe, uh, holds in five dimensions as well as in four. In fact, the Einstein equations, they're not really specific to the dimensionality. So that was Kaluza's insight to say, let's apply the Einstein equations in five dimensions. It should work. Everything that makes us love the Einstein equations in four dimensions makes them compelling in five as well. And so Kaluza's insight was to write the Einstein equations in five dimensions. And in fact, when, after Kaluza did that and Klein, um, <clears throat> other researchers, I want to say Bryce DeWitt, but other guys got the idea and said, oh, well, let's go to six dimensions, seven. You know, you start doing it, you have all the degrees of freedom you want, everything's unified. And so this has really been the basis of unified field theories ever since. Next slide. Okay, so before we get into the fifth dimension, uh, this is two representations of the Einstein equation. Uh, these are, this here is what you would call the Einstein equations. It generalizes Laplace's equation. Uh, this is sort of the generalization of the del squared phi. And this is the generalization of the density you can see we have the gravitational constant here, but, but now this is a tensor equation. So it's a four by four <coughs> matrix, really. They're symmetric, so it's 10 equations. There's 16 components in the four by four matrix, but it's symmetric, so there's actually 10 independent equations here. Um, I mentioned Lagrangian on the first day. This is the Lagrangian for the Einstein equation, so they're completely identical. Uh, and actually, you may have heard the contest between Hilbert and Einstein. Hilbert got this, and Einstein got this. Uh, and in fact, it was almost simultaneous, really. But Hilbert recognized that Einstein, you know, had primacy. Uh, Einstein derived this equation from different principles, seat of the pants, intuition. But uh, it was Hilbert that found the Lagrangian. And... Uh, you can see that uh, the metric tensor, this is gravity, uh, it kind of it couples in both terms of Lagrangian. Um, unlike in my uh, little session on Tuesday, I've now I'm carrying this guy. This is the square root of the determinant of the metric. It's essential to make everything covariant. So I'm, I'm carrying it explicitly now. Uh, some textbooks drop it because it's the same for everything. But you got to have this guy to get everything to work out. So these are the Einstein equations, the, Einstein, the Hilbert Lagrangian, uh, the Einstein equations. Next slide. So the Kaluza hypothesis was to extend that same thing to five dimensions. Uh, so I've written here are the Einstein equations in five dimensions now. 
and their vacuum equations, there's no five-dimensional stress energy, although Kaluza had one. I'm keeping it simple here. Kaluza actually did almost everything. He laid everything out in his original paper. Uh, I think people don't realize how much he really did, but uh, anyway, he even had a five-dimensional stress energy tensor, and we can talk about that offline. But for now, the vacuum equations. Now I've put a little twiddle, a tilde, <laughs> over the quantities so that we know they're five-dimensional. And I'm using small Roman indices to indicate uh, spanning five coordinates. So the Roman indices go from zero to four, let's say, and the Greek indices go from zero to three. So there's four of those. So again, I've got the, also the 5D Hilbert Lagrangian. I think I was the first one, actually, that I found in literature to actually find this Lagrangian. Of course, it's dead simple. It's what everyone thought it would be. But the Lagrangian, I think, was never really worked out for the Kaluza theory until this paper. Uh, I've given it to some of you. And I actually did it with tensor algebra software in Mathematica using an extension called Exact, who, uh, it's like an extension of Mathematica, free for general relativity, it does symbolic tensor computations. And so I was able to verify that the five-dimensional equations, this is the Lagrangian, in fact, this is the five-dimensional Hilbert Lagrangian. So it's all good. Uh, so, now to focus on the 5D metrics, so uh, this guy, what I've written is the inverse metric. So the indices are upstairs. Downstairs, we call it, like here, might be kind of the normal form of the metric. Uh, if you contract the inverse metric and the metric, you just get the delta function, a diagonal matrix. So if you have the inverse, you can calculate that one or vice versa. So to keep it simple, I've only shown the inverse metric here. The, uh, the irregular metric's not much more complicated, but this really illustrates the elegance of this unification. So we've got a four by four matrix here, G mu nu, and then we write the electromagnetic four vector, kind of framing it. So there, there's four rows here, four columns here, one and one. Uh, so there's an extra space here. There's a corner thing. So once you play this game and you, you, you use this approach to unify gravity and electromagnetism, you have one more field. So the scalar field comes along. And when Kaluza wrote these equations, no one knew what the scalar field was. And it was even thought to be perhaps spurious, maybe a drawback. Um, now in the age of dark energy and dark matter and Higgs, you know, now we're all used to scalar fields, but back in the day, I think it was considered a problem. And the one simplification Kaluza made is he pretty much set this to one in 1919. And uh, a lot of work was done over subsequent decades by a lot of different people on scalar tensor theories. And so people kind of bucket this Kaluza theory in with so-called scalar tensor, bronze and Dickey, perhaps the most famous example. Um, this is different than bronze Dickey theory. So, uh, so that's the inverse metric. Here's the new scalar field. Uh, this is not the Newtonian gravitational potential. Sorry, <laughs> I'll get to you in just a second, Jose. This is not the Newtonian potential. This is a new scalar field. Uh, so we got the, four, the 10 components of the metric tensor, the four components of the electromagnetic vector potential, and one scalar field, 15 fields. Uh, okay, Jose. What is K? What is K? Uh, K is a constant I'll show you in a moment. It's not Boltzmann's constant. So it's just, it's a constant term because the metric is typically unitless. Obviously, the vector potential is not, so this is the constant that makes this unitless. Yeah. So, 
So that's the Kaluza hypothesis. Oh, the cylinder condition. Kaluza introduced that. Uh, now, what that says is that none of the fields depend on the fifth coordinate. So that's really, this is just an observation. If you believe the theory, we don't see the fifth dimension, you know, we, we don't see it. So where is it? This is mathematically uh, the way of saying that we don't see it because it never changes. It's all uniform. You can't tell there's no frame of reference. Um, when Klein came along, he said, oh, I'm going to replace this cylinder condition and assume it's microscopic. That explains why we don't see it. But this is the classical way of talking about the fifth dimension and why, why we don't see it. It's not really a why, it's just an observation. Now I will note, if you abandon the cylinder condition, things get really complicated. You get a, you get a lot, we've got uh, the extrascalar field and these fields. If you add in, if you do the full set of derivatives, you get all sorts of stuff, all sorts of degrees of freedom. You could probably make it fit a lot of things. Um, and in fact, there's a guy, I think he passed away recently, named Paul Wesson in Toronto. Maybe George knows him. Uh, he did a lot of work. He called it space-time matter. But what he did was he, he kept the cylinder condition, and all of that junk he sort of treated as a source term, and he said it's the origin of matter derivatives with respect to the fifth coordinate. But if you, if you relax this condition, you get a lot of stuff. You can call it whatever you want. And Paul Wesson made a cottage industry of, you know, keeping that fifth derivative. Um, okay, next slide. So, these are the vacuum field equations. I should say the five-dimensional vacuum. So this is a busy slide. I'm gonna talk you through it. Um, again, I, I'm going to start at the bottom. Uh, I expanded out that, that five-dimensional Hilbert Lagrangian. This is what you get. And so I put new, actually I published a paper a year or two ago, but it's probably new to almost everyone. This is the new uh, Kaluza Lagrangian, if you will. And in fact, if you recall from on Tuesday, it's identical to the regular Lagrangian, but it has factors of phi, the scalar field, phi and phi cubed. So, which is unusual. Uh, you don't really see Lagrangians like this. Uh, when people want put a scalar field in a Lagrangian, they typically do this, d mu phi, d mu phi. So they contract the gradient of the scalar field. That's a typical scalar field Lagrangian. And you can see in all the old work, especially Bronze and Dickey, they wanted this and they put it in and they had two sets of field equations really. And they thought that this was the real stuff and maybe this, they didn't have this sort of dependence. So I think that's a significant result. Uh, we have this strange Lagrangian where there is basically no dynamics with the scalar field. And this is new because the, the guys who originally wrote down the field equations, they thought there was dynamics. And, and I did too for a long time until I grinded it through with Mathematica and realized that the Lagrangian is, doesn't have any derivatives of the scalar field. So uh, now, the, here are the field equations. Uh, you can just crank it through uh, using the standard, the five-dimensional field equations, keep everything straight, put the metric in, crank it through. You get hundreds and hundreds of terms, so you would love this one, Jose, on Mathematica. But eventually, <laughs> it all simplifies away into something like this. So there's some noteworthy things with this set of field equations. Um, can you go back one slide, Robin? I'll just make reference. This quantity G is a way, a shorthand way of writing this whole term here. So forward. 
Okay, so now I've got, I'm going to look at the g mu nu, which is sort of corresponds to this part of the metric, if you will. And then again, I've got a, a piece on the, on the boundaries. And then the g55 is sort of the corner field equation. So, so let's start at the top. Uh, when you take the g mu nu term, you get the conventional Einstein equations. And so this was the great Kaluza miracle, the great discovery. And what, what's so profound about it is this is not a vacuum equation anymore. Uh, this is showing the electromagnetic source term in the field equations, and there's a source term with the scalar field. And this scalar field, uh, stress energy tensor, involves all the derivatives of the scalar field you might expect. So this is a quite standard uh, scalar field stress energy tensor. And it comes from this simple Lagrangian. So a lot of the confusion in literature was fussing with things like that in the Lagrangian to get something like this, but it turns out you don't need it at all. Okay, the other interesting thing, and this is, uh, now we come to an implication for uh, breakthrough propulsion, is I see the scalar field as a tunable coupling to gravity. So this is, you know, sort of the Newton's law. This is where you've got the factor of G, and uh, if we linearize it, you get down to just a mass density. But now we have a field in front. So it's like, to me, it's like a knob, an electromagnetically tunable knob to control the coupling of matter to gravity. So this is a good thing. I, now one needs to go through, well, does it work? Does you know, the units work out? Do you, do you have to have a Jupiter mass of something and, and all of that? But it's a different kettle of fish uh, because this scalar field is coupling the gravity and the electromagnetism. Um, this guy here is the typical Maxwell equation, but again, it's got the uh, scalar field in there. So you've got derivatives of the scalar field. I've written it in a compact way, but if you take this outside of the derivative, you can look at it as like an effective source term. Maybe it's like a displacement current, a five-dimensional displacement current. It's something like that. Uh, and so we've got some coupling here with electromagnetism and the scalar field. And then if that works, then you can go and try and tune the force of gravity. Last but not least, so the G55, again, it's new. Uh, the old, all the guys in the literature, uh, I don't think they get this equation right. Again, they have a more conventional scalar field equation with derivatives of the scalar field. What this is telling us is that this scalar field is depending algebraically on the scalar curvature and on the electromagnetic field. And so I've, I've been playing with this, uh, you know, trying to make some ground, but uh, cosmologically, I can easily find the scalar curvature for the Robertson-Walker metric, which is the metric of the expanding universe. Very straightforward. Uh, we know the you know, cosmic electromagnetic field, more or less. But I'm still, I'm just not sure what this scalar field really corresponds to. Um, this guy here, this contraction of the stress energy tensor is just E squared minus B squared. So, you know, what is the cosmic E squared minus B squared? That's something I'm not sure. I've, you know, I've thought of a few different things, but that's a question in all of this. So, got the scalar curvature, E squared minus B squared, scalar field. Um, so, uh, again, Kaluza set phi equal to one. So he, he never had this stuff, but the guys who did include the scalar field had the wrong Lagrangian. I think they had the wrong scalar field. Um, but it, it's really miraculous. This, I haven't written it out, but this electromagnetic stress energy tensor is quite complicated. It's traceless. It, it's, it is the stress energy tensor. Uh, and it, you know, the fact that it pops right out of this math is quite compelling. What? Oh. So, okay. 
So you contend with your G55 here that that's not one? Yeah, I'm saying scalar field is not a constant. But actually, uh, no, no one ever got this algebraic. They had a differential equation in the scalar field, set it to one, it all collapsed down. But you, you can see, though, if I set phi to one, I get exactly general relativity and electrodynamics. This goes away because it's derivatives <laughs> of phi. This goes to one. This is still here. Not sure what it is. So. Mu zero is? Uh, yeah, mu zero is the permeability of free space. Okay, so you could replace one over that by c squared. Can't reduce the yes the c four to c squared and put an epsilon zero on top. Yep, and I do that later. You're right. It eliminates a couple c squared. It eliminates a c squared. Um, but yeah, and I work in MKS units to make the electromagnetic dependence explicit. And again, when I first started, I was in CGS units, you get lost. This is not a place to set G and C equal to one. You know, you really need to see the units to understand what's going on. So, okay, next, oh, uh, Todd? What happened to the A squared? The, the what? The, mag the A squared term in this. You had it originally A squared uh, plus the scalar field. You mean in the previous in slide? five-dimensional metric. Let's go the, back. In the 5-5, five, five, you had a square. Yeah, that was no, 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 no. oh. it, it, This is the contraction of the electromagnetic four-vector potential. So, so what happened to that? I mean, where it, it's, it, it's in there. It's in there. Yeah, the, I, I could say I can write out the, uh, the regular metric. Um, and it's kind of got, it's a little more, it actually has the A's here. Uh, it's got the A's here. It's got G mu nu plus something quadratic in the A's, and then just phi here. So, so there, everything's accounted for. We've got 15 equations and 15 unknowns. So it's all there. Okay, next slide. And next, okay. Now, the other side of the coin is like we talked with Martin, you got the field equations. The field equations tell you how the field depends on the sources, or you have, might have vacuum equations, but you need a separate independent set of equations to tell you how bodies, objects, respond to electric and magnetic fields. Uh, and that's the geodesic equation. Now, in the general relativity books, they can actually, the smart guys can derive the geodesic equation, or actually, this would be it here in four dimensions, equal to zero. They can derive that from the field equations, but I don't know, it, you know they, they want to get it as compact as possible. But I treat the geodesic equation as independent, and I think it basically is, because you have to go have a lot of hand waving to go from the field equations to the geodesic equations. And Einstein did not, he, he actually was able to get the geodesic equation from the field equations eventually, but when he started, I believe he just published the geodesic equation. So, again, I've got a five-dimensional geodesic equation. Here's what it looks like in four dimensions. So I just put a twiddle on everything. <laughs> And my indices are running over five coordinates now, not just four. And I've introduced theta, which is sort of a five-dimensional proper time. And again, there's no source term. And uh, I've defined, you can see that this is defined as a five-dimensional uh, proper velocity. So there's five of these. Uh, and you can see that when you just start plugging in the coordinates, um, and I focus on the space-time the space -time piece. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna ignore the fifth piece here, go down to the space-time piece of this equation and expand it out and voila, you pick up a term that's linear in the four velocity. So yeah, this, the geodesic equation of five dimensions, only quadratic but when you expand it out, you pick up a piece linear and you say, aha, that's the Lorentz force term. 
and I've written it here. So this is existing theory. This is gravity here, and this is uh, the Lorentz force law here. And so an identification is made to say that uh, this U5 is actually electric charge. And Kaluza made that identification. Um, now, the, the really amazing thing is that when you actually calculate this connection, you get exactly the Faraday tensor, or the, you get exactly this guy here, plus some stuff in the scalar field. So again, it would seem like a miracle. You take the same metric, plug it into two independent equations, and you recover independently the four-dimensional uh, versions. So it's, it does seem quite miraculous. Uh, there's this guy here. This actually caused the guys a lot of trouble back in the day because these uh, speeds can be very large, but it depends on the gradient of the scalar field. So if there's no gradients in the scalar field, you don't have this and you really don't have any problems on the practical level. This, uh, it's more a, a bit of the transformation. I wouldn't worry too much about it, but I haven't seen any significance in that term, but it's necessary to do the translation from 5D to 4D. Okay, next. So, to, to make that identification, you know, we, we get the, the, the uh, Maxwell field strength tensor in that term linear and the four velocity. But to make it all work, we have to identify the speed in the fifth dimension, the proper speed, with charge to mass. And so here, David, I've done what you suggested. I you know, combined and dropped a factor of c squared. So now I'm talking in, the, uh, in terms of the permittivity of free space. So this is, again, I said Kaluza. He realized this. Uh, he's identified electric charge as motion in the fifth dimension. So, sort of profound. And this is where it has rested. No progress uh, for okay, a so century. Um, Theorists suggest quantum foam as where the fifth dimension exists, so it's not, it's more of a um, scaling. I think they're thinking microscopic, compact fifth dimension. Right. When they talk quantum, they typically, they, they imagine the fifth is dimension is a, a little circle. Fifth dimension, the fifth dimension can be larger than the Yes, universe. this is a macroscopic. Uh, no, I'm assuming that it's a macroscopic fifth dimension. Like you have, you know, time, space, and X5, okay. the fifth dimension. It's, it's everywhere, you know, it's, it's not microscopic. Okay, so the fifth dimension, I'm rewording it. The fifth dimension is the source of charge, or defines <coughs> charge, or... Uh, when something moves in the fifth dimension, it creates electric charge. Okay. So if you see an electron sitting on your bench, uh, let's say, it's actually shooting through the fifth dimension, but of course, we live in three dimensions, so it doesn't appear to move. Okay, so, so, so it's like time. What, I, what I'm hearing yeah. is there's, there's the quantum fifth dimension, and then there's the macro. Yes, this is all classical. So general relativity, E and M, we're all classical. No H bars, okay. no wave functions. And no standard model as a part of that diagram. No standard model. Standard model derived from this set? No. The standard model is the quantum unification of electromagnetism and the weak force into electroweak, and then we have the strong force. That's the standard model. Gravity's not in it. I understand. That, yeah. But, yeah. but if you talk to the symmetry folks, you get SU, how, whatever number you want for 10, yeah. I think is it is for gravity. Whereas to match up E and M, which is at U1, and uh, standard models at SU, SU3, okay? So from a symmetry standpoint, Jim, maybe you can help me or, or bail me out, I don't know. Uh, 
it's, this is not quantum electrodynamics. This is not okay. electroweak, no quantum nothing. So, so like, QED is separate from this stuff. Yes. Right? And in the future, you'll show how, us how to unify it. No, I, I believe when they first started down the road, I believe one of the reasons this theory was rejected was because they thought a true theory of gravity would have to be quantum. So what's the use in unifying classical general relativity with classical electromagnetism when we know the world's quantum? I think that was the thinking. Now what we know, a hundred years later, the smartest guys, Pauli, Feynman, Schwinger, you know, whoever looked at this, they, there is no quantum general relativity. So we've waited a hundred years with the smartest guys. You know, what, are we gonna wait another hundred years? Is there someone smarter than Feynman who will do it? Maybe so. Todd, are you gonna clear this up for us tomorrow? <laughs> I hope so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm ready to give up on quantum gravity. I mean, isn't a hundred years long enough? I don't know. That's a good statement. Yeah, Tony. Oh wait, uh, Nembo was first, I'm sorry. Okay. Just the and then Tony, yeah. Uh, so you say that, uh, for example, an electron, uh, you see the charge, and this means that it's moving in the in the okay? Yes. But this is interesting, because it means that it's going always at the very same speed, right? It's for yes. the electron, uh, yes. for the photon. Yes. So they are not changing by anything. Yes, that's right. That's yeah. It's, um, and, and in fact, I haven't plugged in the numbers, but if you plug in the charge to mass ratio of the electron, this is like 10 to the 21 C. So it's super hyper luminal. So those things in, in, uh, you know, in, in meters per second, they're way hyper relativistic. So if I- Elementary that, particles. Okay. Yeah, you have like a big, like one electron on a house. It's not hyper, -rel you know, relativistic, but... Okay, uh, I, we had Tony, uh, yeah. I'm gonna argue with you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, it is believed that quantum gravity, the effects of quantum gravity will be seen at the Planck scale. It, it, because you've got C and G in that equation, you, you can uh, rewrite that equation in terms of Planck terminologies. You know, Planck masses, Planck lengths or something because because uh, Planck guys are got. Are, well, there's no H bar. I, I still think you can take rearrange the, the C and the G's and come out without the Planck bar. In fact, I think the 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 uh, charge to mass ratio actually has some relationship to to the to Planck constant anyway. Yeah, my my understanding, Tony, is there are just independent parameters. I don't think the standard model predicts them, uh, charge or mass. Uh, and oh, but uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Oh, great. Go ahead. What can you measure in on the right hand side of the equation? What can we measure directly? This QM is is a relative ratio, so that's that's the purpose of this talk. So I'm getting to to the experimental thing. This is this is just the concept here, just that charge equals motion, uh, and 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 maybe as an auxiliary statement, there's a an energy momentum charge five vector. We're used to energy momentum four vector. You actually get now energy momentum charge five vector, and there's a sort of a five dimensional gamma out in front. Very similar to the four dimensional. You know the four vector would be there would be a gamma c and v. Right? Now we have one more term and a different gamma. Okay, you know? so if we have quarks, the charge to mass ratio is a little bit different. What then? Well, what's the mass of a quark? They're basically massless. All of the, the mass of a proton is kinetic energy. That's a whole other kettle of fish, you know? I, yes. I, I don't want to bring quarks. Yes. Huh? 95%. 95%. Right. Yes, I'm rounding. <laughs> it's, mainly, it's mainly kinetic energy. Yeah. Maybe what would be the mass of a quark? Like 15 EV or something? Uh, something small uh, at that, you know. And in fact, this isn't me. Who is it that did the uh, quarks are mainly kinetic energy? Uh, what's his name? Wilczek. Wilczek. Yeah, Wilczek had a thing just... I'm just gonna do simple physics and I'm gonna show that mass is, there's mass from no mass, or what did he call it? Uh, something like that. Okay, Greg.
So um, I don't know if you saw or David Froney's <coughs> work from probably the <coughs> mid '90s to the early 2000s, where he actually had a diagram like that in his paper, like showing this? that there was this fifth dimension that you could rotate into, basically that was 90 degrees out of phase from our own, where it allowed you to do a whole lot of different things, um, superluminal travel or a variety of others. So it's it's interesting that what you're proposing here and what he proposed then, especially since you drew that, you basically mm -hmm. what he had in his paper 15 or 20 years ago, mm -hmm. is pretty similar. So this is almost like the first physics, you know, Greek, Greek letters type of <laughs> approach mm -hmm. to analyzing that. that term. And he looked at it from, a term, from terms of like momentum and um, uh, energetics and things like that, rather mm -hmm. than the micro microscopic uh, subatomic type of level. So, um, so far, I'm just showing you what collude. This is 1921. You right. Know, so, it has yeah. a lot of similarities to yeah. what other people have thought about a yeah. fifth dimension type of thing, and that there's motion there that affects here, mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, so far, nothing new. This is all old stuff. Does uh, have that recorded uh, system that you put up there in these papers? What, this? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this was what he had in mind. He actually had that? Well, I don't, he didn't have this picture, but he didn't have this idea that it would be compact. He had, that it would be sort of similar. Yeah, it's just, it's a, like, like time. You know, time, like, we, we don't see the time dimension, but, you know, we're moving through it. So, uh, it's not a, hard, a stretch to say that's how the fifth dimension is. No, so. I'm just looking at you. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah and then Heidi. <laughs> Just a, just a question for my clarification more than anything. I don't have the tensors as much as I would like. Um, earlier you had the <coughs> cylinder condition where the fifth dimension didn't have any gradient, but you had the theta there versus the tau. What's the relationship here? Because usually when there's no gradient, there's no motion, there's no changes. And so when you have talked about motion in the fifth dimension, I start trying to rectify yeah. the different things. things. There's no, the fields, there's no, the, the fields have no derivative. So there's no, the gravitational field, you know, this, this 10 component tensor, the electromagnetic field, this four component vector, and the scalar field under the cylinder condition assume not to depend on fifth coordinate. But that doesn't mean things aren't moving in the fifth coordinate. So. I just wanted to make sure I understood. Yeah, that. and uh, Heidi? I was going to say, I just look in the numbers for that dx, phi, d tau, and I got 2 times 10 to the 30 meters per second. 10 to the 30? Yeah, 10 to the 30. That seems wow. Well. It should be 10 to the 21. What'd you, what particle did you use? Oh, good point, the electron. No, it should be 10 to the 21, I think. But it's big. Yeah. It's big. It's big. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next. Oh, wait, uh, Bill. Um. These uh, father son Korean Taehan Kim and Hyun Byuk Kim, July 2015. They came up with this idea that the the fifth dimension was a deformation on the uh, on the fourth dimension, dragging it in and out there, thereby causing curvature, tensor curvature, or gravity. Um, and and you're talking about. It's that fifth dimension in motion causing charge, right? Well, I'm saying that, uh, well, let's step back. Um, the, the energy momentum charge. Energy is motion in time, right? Energy is motion in time. In fact, it's this derivative. It's the derivative of time with respect to proper time. Energy is motion in time. Momentum is motion in space. Okay, <clears throat> no problem. It's the derivative of the space coordinate with respect to proper time. This just says electric charge is the derivative of the fifth coordinate with respect to time, proper time. Yeah. So it's just like energy. It's, it's when, when something moves in time, it gets energy, at least something with mass. Something moves in space with mass, it gets momentum. Something moves in the fifth dimension, it gets charge. Electric charge. For posterity, the video and myself, can you explain what proper time is again? Yeah, proper time 
is a way of making your derivatives covariant. That, there's probably a lot of ways you can say it, but uh, it's given by, how can I say this? Oh, right up here. Um, T is gamma tau, tau dilation. Well, there, there's maybe a, a lot of ways to slice the, skin the cat. This is probably the most general way it's the invariant five-dimensional length element. That's what proper time is. So um, in special relativistic terms, it would be c squared dt squared minus dx squared. And now you're starting to see the Lorentz thing, you know, the gamma factor. So that's proper time. So in fifth, five dimensions to follow on, then d theta squared is going to be c squared dt squared minus dx squared minus dx5 squared. That's the five dimensional, that's what d theta is. So, okay, so we're all caught up to 1919. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna be here a while. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so next slide. Okay. So now this is uh, what I'm proposing, new physics. Um, no, uh, I think I said at the outset uh, when I talked about what is a good theory, if you just have another viewpoint but no new prediction, it, you know, it's not really a new theory. And so the Kaluza hypothesis, to the extent it just replicated general relativity and electromagnetism, was not a new theory. We need a new prediction. And so that's what I want to show you, a new prediction, something we can test to verify or falsify the Kaluza hypothesis, to verify or falsify the existence of a fifth dimension. So, and I propose to do it with time dilation. So you can see here, in fact, I, uh, we were set up by David's question. So here is the invariant length element now I've dropped space. So let's say we're just fixed on the table and we want things to go in time and in the fifth dimension. So like an electron on the bench. This is the invariant length element. And you get a beta factor just like you do with uh, velocity uh, beta. And in fact, it's given by this number that we required to match the uh, Lorentz force law. So we have some time dilation here. <coughs> and so what does that mean? Uh, there, there, there's a couple implications here, but it appears, let's say naively, if there is a rest frame in the fifth dimension, and then you can set some, a, a clock at rest and a clock in motion in the fifth dimension, there should be time dilation. So that's what this is saying. So, that's the seed, you know, that's what, that's what we're going to dive in on and see if we can make that a little firmer. But, but this is the basic idea. We have a relativistic time dilation due to motion, uh, but yet it's the motion, so to speak, of electric charge. There's that classic example of the decay of muons in the atmosphere. They shouldn't survive to reach the Earth's surface but because of time dilation, they live long enough to make it. So it's this sort of thing, but instead of the time dilation due to motion, it's due to the charge itself. So, so this is what I want to explore. Next slide. Okay, so first question, is there a rest frame in the fifth dimension? Is it like time? Like there's no rest frame for time at least for a massive object. Uh, so we can't stop time. You can't be at rest in time, but we can be at rest in space. So that's a fundamental difference between space and time. And this theory doesn't tell you what it is. Uh, is there a rest frame in the fifth dimension or not? You need a rest frame to get time dilation. So this is a, a question I pose. This is a question that would be answerable by experiment. You know, among, you know, uh, probe is, is there a fifth dimension? Uh, we can also probe, is there a rest frame in the fifth dimension? Next slide. I got some questions here. Can a charged clock be realized? 
That's a question. And I think I've talked to you, some of you about it. What is a charge clock? How could we do it? And I'll get into that. But I pose the question. Next slide. What is the meaning of a mass of a clock? Because it's the charge to mass ratio. So obviously we can uh, put a clock on a freight train and you know, it's set it moving, but now we sort of have mass tied into that somehow. And again, so it's a philosophical fundamental question. What is the mass of a clock? I don't know, uh, but I'm going to propose something. It might be that in this instance you might use something like, you know, like a cesium decay, like what they based on the top, like what they based the atomic clock on, you know, using it at that level yep. of something that's known at the atomic level to have a repeatable instance. Oh, you don't want me to review that now, do you? <laughs> <laughs> but it might be that, you know, something that kind of clock. Yeah, and I had thought about nuclides and so on, and, and we'll, we'll, that's exactly what we're going to discuss now, the rest of the talk. What can we realize that what would the experiment be? Um, next slide. Okay, so properties of a charged clock. If there is a rest frame in the fifth dimension, then there should be time dilation or time contraction, we're not sure which way the sign is, of a charged clock. This would be an effect unknown to physics and never probed. So totally new thing. No one's ever looked for it. No one's ever thought about it. If any of you experimentalists could find it, you could be the next Millikan or you know Rutherford or something. So it'd be a big discovery. Next slide. Um, the clock must be uniformly charged. Uh, at first, when I, when I started on this, I've been wrestling with the concept of a charge clock for like five or six years. When I first started, I had the naive idea that I would you know, take something charged and put a clock inside, and there'd be charge on the, you know, it'd be a charged clock. But it's not the right charged clock. Because, I don't know, if you, if you think about it spatially, uh, this is the edges, let's say. I, let's say I cut a slice through the water bottle. Um, this is charge. I put a charge on the surface. I have a clock on the inside. But there's no charge here. This isn't moving. So you need a uniformly charged body to test this. It's got to be charged through and through. And of course, we know charge is point particles. So what is the smearing, you know, uh, is it only for the point? Or is it, is there like some averaging effect to the time dilation? Anyway, has to be uniformly charged, that's the trick. How do you come up with a uniformly charged clock? 